Rotem guided components. Um, and as Tim introduced me, my name's Stuart. I'm the lead TP um, within Gloucestershire NHS Foundation Trust. So just a bit of background from me. Um, the context of Rotem guided components um, if for this presentation is in the context of bleeding, um, just to make you aware of that before I start talking. Um, so just a bit of a bit of background before I get into the nitty gritty of, of Rotem and, and how a Rotem machine can guide clinical decision making. Um, so as I said, it's in the context of, of bleeding. So in major hemorrhage um, in our clinical areas, as many, as you, many of you will know, um, this is a clinical emergency. Um, and as the BSH guidance um, that were produced last year in 2022, um, it's a clinical emergency that can result in quite a high morbidity and mortality. Um, and worldwide in obstetrics and maternity, it's one of the most common causes of, of death um, at the time of delivery. Um, and defining and diagnosing major hemorrhage is often quite tricky and difficult because each time we have someone bleeding, it can be a little bit different depending on where they're bleeding from and where they are in, the, in terms of logistics and location. Um, often clinical teams use clinical parameters to help them. So they look at the patient observations, so their heart rate, blood pressure, et cetera, um, what the patient looks like, how much blood is being lost. But this is really, really tricky and difficult to standardise and quantify. Um, and as I put on the slide, um, it's, it is quite insensitive. Um, so the detection and correction of a coagulopathy um, is, is really important in someone that is, is, is hemorrhaging um, and to manage them, that manage them appropriately and correctly. Um, so, and this is where Rotem can, can come in um, really, really handy. Um, so Rotem is a point of care um, machine um, and it's a test for hemostatic analysis and it can be used um, in clinical settings um, and in the context of this presentation it's in the context of major hemorrhage so using a point of care testing device for hemostatic analysis to detect coagulopathy um, in a major hemorrhage or a patient that is bleeding so that's just a bit of background with with what I'm going to be talking about so in terms of the what these tests are, so it's a viscoelastic test and these tests are um, being increasingly used in the management of major hemorrhage. Um, and um, there's several different um, companies or machines that are on the market. So my presentation is will be talking and focusing on Rotem because that's just the one that I have the most experience with, with within the trust I work, work in, but I'm in no way um, paid or anything by Worthen or Rotem. So there are other uh, machines and companies out there. So there is TEG, which is probably the most common point of care viscoelastic test and assay that's out there. And there's also one called Sonoclot. So these are point of care tests that come under the point of care umbrella um, in that they're little machines out there in the clinical area. Um, or they might, they might possibly be in the lab as well, um, but ours are certainly out there in the clinical area. Um, and they, like I said before, allow rapid assessment of coagulation, how a person is currently clotting or not. Um, and they're currently widely used um, within the NHS and worldwide in trauma, um, in vascular, um, in a lot of transplant surgery within um, hepatopathology in, in liver transplants, um, cardiac thoracic surgery, and certainly in obstetrics. So they're, they're quite widely used in, in, in these specialties. Um, already and it's quite embedded in quite a lot of practice. So as BMS is on this call, surely, and being a BMS myself by background, surely can we just not do a coagulation screen? That's, you know, our test that we do um, to assess how well or not somebody, um, how well somebody's clotting, um, which is still the case. Coagulation screens, I'm not um, saying they're not a good idea. They are certainly a very, very good test to do. So then the BSH guidelines that um, were introduced last year, which are all about major hemorrhage, um, quote that serial hemostatic tests should be checked regularly. So every 30 to 60 minutes, and I've just taken a little snip from the hemorrhage recommendations that is in the guidelines. So in a, um, in a, a sort of ideal world, the clinical teams should be taking a coagulation screen or a, or a test to assess coagulation every 30 to 60 minutes to assess um, how well someone is clotting during um, hemorrhage to guide essentially hemostatic blood component infusion. However, in reality, um, there are intrinsic difficulties and problems with this above guidance if we're just going to be doing coagulation screens every 30 to 60 minutes. 
And the main reason for this is simply that the coagulation test isn't a rapid test. Now, I'm sure many of you guys on this call who actually do coagulation screens in your day to day job can do them very quickly. Um, and I'm by no means saying that you can't, but the turnaround times of lab coag screens can vary um, and they can be often a bit too slow for a, an emergency rapidly well an emergency clinical situation that is rapidly um, evolving um, someone who is actively bleeding and this is where the viscoelastic hemostatic assays such as Rotem come into their own and that's why um, they're increasingly being used to assist clinicians and teams who are managing a patient who is bleeding. So just a bit of background about coagulopathy um, you could you know, anybody could talk about coagulopathy all day. It's an incredibly complex and um, interesting topic. But essentially, my um, simple quotation and de definition is this, the inability of, a, of the blood to clot is by definition a coagulopathy. The coagulopathy of bleeding um, is related to um, blood loss, obviously, so someone who is losing um, whole blood, um, so including their clotting factors and everything, and platelets and everything that's in their blood to um, help and assist in coagula coagulation. You've got consumption of all the coagulation factors for someone who's bleeding because the body is trying to produce a clot to stem wherever the patient is, wherever they are bleeding from, so clotting factors are being used. You've got activation of fibrinolysis um, and you've also got hemodilution. So in a patient that is bleeding, whether that's traumatic bleeding or um, who is non-traumatic bleeding, the clinical areas will be probably giving um, crystalloid or colloid infusions of fluids to help um, improve and increase their circulating blood volume to, to make sure the patient doesn't go into hypovolemic shock. So um, if they give normal fluids, which is good practice, you are therefore diluting the blood that is there. So therefore, it's this is referred to as hemodilution. And this paper in 2014, I felt, described it quite easily. Um, there's lots of papers about coagulopathy that were a bit too complex for my, my brain. So this one, I think, described it quite well. And I've just put the paper there for anyone who wishes to read it. Um, and then... In terms of coagulopathy, this coagulopathy is associated with with worse outcomes for our patients. It's quite widely documented. Wi widely documented. Um, so therefore, it's really important um, and imperative for us to correct any coagulopathy as part of hem hemostatic resuscitation for someone who is bleeding. So the cryostat two trial in 2019 um, demonstrated that coagulopathy was already present when patients presented in major trauma. Um, and they presented early with it so therefore that's often why FFP is used quite aggressively and early in trauma um, in a one-to-one -one ratio which is in the BSH guidelines um, and FFP being the component of choice to manage coagulopathy um, by that it's got the coagulation factors and, uh, and everything that's in there to help to help the patient clot as well as a good um, volume expanding component because essentially that's that's a really good thing to do so it's got clotting factors in there but it's also expanding the patient's circulating volume the ffp is the component of choice to manage to manage the coagulopathy um the coagulopathy of bleeding because it's got that balanced source of coagulation factors that that you need so there's lots of bsh guidance um out there about what we do in major hemorrhage from a laboratory perspective and from a from a clinical perspective I just took some snips from the BSH guidance from last year, which was um, 2022, where they revised the BSH guidance on the management of major hemorrhage. Um, so I won't go through all that, but that's what essentially they say. And one of the suggestions or one of the recommendations is that the um, Rotem's tags are used, can be used to guide transfusion therapy um, in cardiac surgery. Although in other clinical settings, the trauma obstetrics, um, it's up to their own hospitals to evaluate cost and the benefit of running um, a point of care hemostatic test to guide transfusion therapy, which is a bit ambiguous. It's really annoying and it'd be really good if they could recommend it much more clear, but I think it's just because the evidence isn't there. So just a little bit more about Rotem. So um, this is again the point of care device that, that we've got here in Gloucestershire. Um, whoever came up with the name, I have no idea, but it stands for rotational thromboelastometry. Um, I, I can always forget what it's what it's called. So it's in the presentation, it's just referred to as, as Rotem, which is far, far easier. And that's just a picture of what the machine looks like on the left-hand side for those who've not seen it before. 
Um, that's a picture of the coag sample that we, the, the type of sample and vacuum chain is the sample types we have here in Gloucestershire. Obviously, it varies within different hospitals, but it's a coagulation sample that we use on that. And that's just a picture below the sample of the cartridge that we pop in the machine that um, is essentially the, the reagent container that, that, that where the blood goes and where the, the reactions occur. Um, just a bit of background of how the machine works, and I'm always baffled and I'm always in, in awe of people that, that, that do all the research and make this up. My brain is just spark, it just makes me feel really inadequate as a person when these people are making these things and these amazing um, point of care devices that have this technology, it, might, it blows my mind. But essentially how it works is that the, um, the blood from the patient or from the sample um, is mixed with the reagents in each of the containers in that cartridge that I mentioned, and there's a magnetic ball in, in those. Again, this is just the growth terms of the TEG, the other ones may work slightly differently. Um, in the chamber, there is a cup um, and a pin, um, and the pin is placed on this axis, and it's powered by a motor, which is sort of described a bit in that, in that picture. Um, when the blood's in there, it shouldn't be clotted, it'll be nice and um, anticoagulated, so it'll be in there mixing. Um, so, um, therefore, the oscillation of that pin um, is not impeded. Um, so, it's similar to the ball and pin method, a lot of the coagulation and coagulometers that you might use um, similar, similar technology. However, when that clot starts to form, so when that patient's blood starts to clot, um, the firmness of that clot or that clot being present restricts that movement. So, the blood becomes more viscous um, or less viscous. Um, and this this impedance is detected um, by a light beam and sensor, and therefore that then starts um, the, the clot formation in, in that in that chamber. And this is then extrapolated into results, which I'll talk about in a second. So the Rotem allows, so what does it do? It allows the measurement of the clot formation and how stable a clot is. It allows um, confirmation of the patient's ability to form a firm, stable clot in real time. So it's not something we have to wait for um, for a coagulation screen, which can potentially take half an hour, 45 minutes. It's point of care coagulation, um, and it does guide transfusion therapy. And this is what I'm just going to focus on um, mainly here. So the question is, well, how? How does it? How do the results from this Rotem machine guide clinical decision making? Um, in terms of what to give a patient who's bleeding, rather than just giving the ratios of two to one or one to one or et cetera, whichever clinical situation we're in. Um, so the Rotem produced a graph that looks like this. I'm not going to go and explain all this because I think it, it, I, my, my understanding of, of the temogram is, is fairly limited. Um, but essentially, this, this mimics what the clot looks like in, in the well. So it produces a graph like this, which looks like a, a fish. Um, and it has um, a graph of coagulation against the time axis called the temogram, and that's what it's called. So there's lots of different results that come from this, such as how quickly, um, so the clotting time, so the start of the measurement to when that clot forms, um, how firm, how big that clot is. So a patient might clot, but it actually might be really small and not very effective. So that's not great. Um, and if that clot then forms, does it then break down to fibrinolysis? So that's what we, we don't want. So this, this temogram here shows that the the clot has formed um, and then it's broken down again, which is not what we want. So that, that indicates that the patient has, has got undergoing fibrinolysis. So that's what the results look like from a Rotem. So in terms of interpretation, you might think, well, OK, you've got this temogram, looks like a fish, looks like a big sausage. Uh, there's some random numbers. So what does that mean? You know, in a major hemorrhage, who is going to look at that and interpret, interpret that highly specific um, result from a, from a machine? Um, so um, the results from the temograms are usually available between five and 10 minutes. So this is a really quick test um, and they're usually interpreted using a local algorithm or policy. So I've just put hours um, here in Gloucestershire on. This is determined by each hospital. So each hospital has a different one and different versions. I think the ones I've seen in the Southwest are all fairly similar because we usually base them on one master one from and ours is based on the Ops Cymru one from Wales. And essentially, the um, results are, are fired into this algorithm, usually by an anesthetist or someone with the patient. And then that then tells them, depending on what result is, is from the road term, what that patient needs. Do they need fibrinogen or cryo? Do they need FFP? Do they need um, platelets? Or do they need tranexamic acid if the patient is having um, the undergoing fibrinolysis? So that's just an example of, of, of the one we have here in Gloucestershire. So I'm just going to sort of talk through case study just to provide a bit of context. 
So this was a, an example and of a case that we had here in Gloucestershire. So this was an obstetric case. Um, so she'd had three previous pregnancies. Um, she was quite, she had quite low, low body weight. And um, just before 30 weeks gestation, she attended our maternity triage um, with a PB bleed. Um, so she was very quickly assessed by the midwives and obstetricians, and they were strongly suspecting that, that she had a placental abruption. Um, so the, there was a decision um, for an emergency cesarean section um, due to the ongoing blood loss. So her PVB was ongoing, um, so it was a, an obstetric emergency. So they did formal blood, so they did a public count, card screen, and they also um, did a sample, or took a sample for the road term at the same time. Um, so at 16.40, that was when um, her routine bloods were taken when she was on triage. At 16.46, the sample had reached our theatre where our road term is and it was popped on the machine. And then at 16.59, the anaesthetist reviewed the results from the road term and um, they then allowed assessment of any coagulopathy, um, which she did. She had a very low fibrinogen and we have fibrinogen concentrate here. And then that allowed the anaesthetist to then decide guided by actual results that this patient needed some urgent fibrinogen replacement. This is just an example of what her temogram looked like. So you can see the difference from the previous one. Um, so the rotem was performed, like I said, and the results were available about five minutes after the sample was um, popped on the machine. Um, we have a fib tem, which is the equivalent of a fibrinogen assessment, and the result was seven in an hour algorithm. If it's less than 10, um, it suggested that the patient's got hypofibrinogenemia. Um, so they potentially need a uh, replacement of fibrinogen. So we gave four grams of fibrinogen concentrate, or you could also give prior precipitate. So low fibrinogen during um, hemorrhage is an important predictor of the severity of the hemorrhage and poor clinical outcome, especially in obstetrics. Um, and we've seen this quite a lot in our obstetric emergencies, especially in placental abruption. This is just a timeline which highlights a little bit more about how, it's how our clinicians really, really love our ROTEM. Um, so, like I said, with the formal bloods I said before, but she attended um, triage at approximately four o'clock. Um, she was in the theatre um, quite quickly. The road time was performed quite quickly. The anaesthetist performed the road, um, looked at the results um, at 16.57. She was given fibrinogen concentrate around about five o'clock, but the formal collab screen wasn't ready until 17.46, which was quite a, which was quite a quick turnaround time. It wasn't too bad. Um, but again, you know, that was an hour after, and by that point, the lady had actually um, given birth um, and the bleeding had then stopped. So um, the Rotem actually provided fast, effective, dual directed therapy at that time. And then there's the, there was a paper in 2021 from the, the Bleeding Strategy for Wales team who said that there's a really good QI program, pro program that uses Rotem as part of a bundle of care. And this was why our obstetricians absolutely love the fact that we've got a road because it really, really improves our management of postpartum hemorrhage or um, antepartum hemorrhage. So again, like I just said, it's dual directed therapy. So the components are given in response to some analytical results, as opposed to randomly just giving two to one ratios of red cells to FFP, if results are readily, readily available as the SH says, or one to one if it's trauma. Um, it's an evolving situation in major hemorrhage. Um, the elastic testing allows that coagulopathy assessment in real time, really, really quickly. Um, and it's efficient and evidence-based decision-making um, rather than sort of going on ratios, um, in what, which, which, which is what the BSH says. So in terms of lab involvement, um, we are really proactive in empowering our BMSs to look at the Rotem while it's running. So there's using Rotem, you can actually view the results live while it's running, so you don't have to be by the machine, which is really, really good. So um, you can re remotely view them, so the anaesthetist in theatre or a clinician in ED can look up the results while they're running. Um, and then alternatively, um, in the lab, our BMSs can get the results up on screen and see. Um, so you might be able to anticipate if there's going to be requests coming in for FFP platelets or fibrinogen or precipitate. Um, we can have soft challenges with requests for clotting components. If the road time results are normal, yet if we have um, requests for random components, there can be soft challenges there, which can actually um, then get the needs to look back at the road time algorithm. They were actually, yes, you're right, I misinterpreted it. So there's some lab involvement there, which is really, really good. We, there are problems and issues, so there are negatives with this. So um, in terms of any point of care equipment, you need um, IQC, um, EQA, 
So um, in the lab, we are the experts on that. We run that on our all our automated equipment in the lab, but it's point of care. It's a bit of a unknown because it's out there in the clinical area with teams that don't really understand that laboratory expertise with IQC and EQA. Um, so we, we've got to have internal quality control and really be participating in the external quality assurance, which we do here. And as a transfusion team, we manage that. Um, so it comes with training education. It's a big training education burden with a, a piece of equipment like this. It's very specialised. Um, and there needs to be everyone that's using it and interpreting it needs to be um, trained up in how to use it and how to interpret it. It is expensive. It's not the cheapest thing. So we live in a world where everything is, is scrutinised in terms of finance. So um, it's a 70 to 80 pound a test for, to run a Rotem. So there is a financial element that, that trusts need to consider when, when using these, these types of equipment. Um, there's no actual published consensus for what the normal ranges are with the figures and the, the figures that come out of um, the Rotem or the TEG. So it's, it's poorly standardized um, and most hospitals use their own, um, well, combine and use it from, a, from all these the stock control trials that have happened that we obviously base ours on the Ox Cumbria one that the Welsh team did. Who pays for the, the reagents and the upkeep and EQA? You know, is it the lab? Is it the clinical area? So I know we here yeah, we found that a bit tricky to manage um, because it's a point of care piece of equipment. So lots of different specialties using obstetrics use it, trauma use it, ED use it. So who pays for it? So that's a big, big problem. Um, and there's low quality published data. So there's no, there's not there's no data, published data yet, that's not been clearly linked to important clinical outcomes, which is what I think everyone's waiting for. Um, and as I think I've already said, the BSH, BSH guidance already states that it's, it's suggested and recommended for use in cardiothoracic surgery, but for only other clinical settings, it's really up to a hospital's decision based on costings and who they use it for, which results in quite a, um, a non-standardised approach across the country. So just to conclude um uh, so using the rotem is goal directed therapy it allows blood components to be requested based on analytical or results produced from a from a machine so which ours is a rotem other than you can use tag and, and sonocot there are gaps in literature and the, and the research gaps are there um that need to prove the effectiveness um in relation to better patient outcomes such as reducing length of stay and um, patient blood management um, and but essentially any viscoelastic hemostatic assays they are being increasingly used in the management of the bleeding patient here i can obviously only speak to our trust it's it's really really um improved massively our management of our our patients who are bleeding we've reduced our pressure and plasma massively and that actually with a lot of patients we don't actually need to give ffp a lot of the time actually we don't we just need to give a few units of red cells and actually not expose um patients to unnecessary blood transfusions, which is a really big tick for a, a PBM perspective and, and myself as a transfusion practitioner, um, that's, a, that's a really, really good thing. And better for patients and not being exposed to unnecessary transfusions. That's just a list of the references that I um, read as part of the presentation. Um, and I think the, the slides are going to be shared with everyone for you to, for you to see. Um, and that's pretty much it for me. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, please, please just ask or pop, pop them in the chat. I'm happy to answer them if I can.